been an interesting uh, week for sure. You never knew WRAO weather would be so riveting television. <laughs> We've never been more interested in landfall and wind speed and categories one to five. In fact, I never knew so much about wind speed and categories until this past week. We were kept up to date uh, moment by moment on the wind speed and what that meant in terms of categorizing the hurricane and what that would mean to us. Someone sent me a couple of pictures just in case our power went out and we weren't able to watch the news. They said you could figure out the wind speed this way. Put your cat out on the front lawn. <laughs> if it's a category one, this is what it'll look like. If it's a category three, this is what it will look like. <laughs> and if it's a category five, this is what will happen. <laughs> Cats immediately go to heaven. It's a win-win, as far as I'm concerned. I thought you could enjoy a laugh. In our current series on nature, I thought this might be the perfect opportunity to speak to the issue of nature gone wild. What do we know from Scripture regarding the wild side of nature, what we commonly refer to as a natural disaster? More importantly, when we consider what we call natural disaster, where did they come from? Why did they arrive when they did? And for the believer, what could they possibly teach us? Now, mankind has, frankly, been interested in attempting to answer the question of hurricanes and storms for several thousands of years. In fact, in Greek mythology, Aeolus was considered the divine keeper of the wind. He was the king of a floating island called Aeolia. Aeolus was in charge of keeping the violent windstorms locked safely on his island. And uh, for the most time he did, unless other gods were angry and convinced Aeolus to let the wind loose to wreak havoc on the human race. So when hurricanes arrived, uh, the Greek world assumed that Aeolus was in on it, and, and the gods were upset. So people, of course, would offer a few more sacrifices to try to appease Aeolus and the gods and bring that wind back onto that island. I found it interesting that just a few weeks ago, the first satellite of its kind was launched with special equipment capable of, of transmitting uh, precise information and data regarding wind profile around the globe. It's the first satellite ever designed with this capability, and it has been named, ironically, Iolus. Surely the gods ought to be recognized. The Vikings had a storm god they called Odin. This was their answer. He was often pictured with wolves and dogs. In fact, dogs would become the animal symbol in the ancient world of wind. Witches, they also believed, uh, supposedly rode their brooms high in the air, stirring up uh, rain clouds, and they were often pictured with what animal? Black cats and in ancient times, they became the animal symbol for heavy rain and ominous storms. The expression, it's raining cats and dogs, emerged from the superstition that high winds and torrential rain was the work of gods and witches who were conspiring together. Now, if you've lived long enough, here in the Western world, you've probably heard God blamed for the latest natural disaster or terrorist bomb or suffering, for that matter, in general. 
I remember reading one journalist who wrote following a hurricane that if this world is a product of intelligent design, then the designer has some explaining to do. I remember the aftermath of Hurricane Fran ripping through Raleigh a few years ago. Wind gusts reached 115 miles an hour. 30 people died in that storm. Damages ranged around two to three billion dollars. I remember all the questions and frankly, many accusations. Nine years later, Hurricane Katrina struck the Gulf Coast. In fact, one of our pastoral staff members, he and his family lost their home in that storm. If you can imagine wind gusts reaching 173 miles an hour, 1,700 people died. Damages exceeded about 130 billion. What exactly would you say to someone who suffered loss in a hurricane? Well, what would you say to someone like Job and his wife who lost all 10 of their children after a seemingly random hurricane gust came out of nowhere and leveled the house where all 10 grown children were celebrating a birthday party? Job chapter 1 and verse 4 informs us that his children had a tradition of getting together and celebrating, the Hebrew text says, their day, that is their birthday. The implication is that they were at the oldest child's home on his birthday. Talk about timing. Talk about the timing of the tragedy of this event. Forty times in your Bible, you'll find the word storm. 35 times in the Old Testament, five times in the New Testament. And nowhere does the Bible suggest or imply that somehow the storm slips out of the control of God. In fact, throughout Scripture, the description of God's sovereign direction and control over nature, even when in our view it's gone wild, is without any kind of apology or hesitation. In fact, the book of Job reveals it more than any other text. In verse 37, or in chapter 37 and verse 9, the text reads, out of the south comes the storm, and out of the north the cold. From the breath of God, ice is made, and the expanse of the waters is frozen. Also, with moisture, he loads the thick cloud, and clouds scatter his lightning. They turn around and around. That's the description of our hurricane. The clouds are turning around and around by his guidance to accomplish all that he commands on the face of the inhabited earth. Now, that might be an uncomfortable implication. I realize there are even well-meaning Christians who would say that God has nothing to do with this kind of phenomenon. It's just the, for uh, the forces of nature, and they've kind of gone wild, and, and God just sort of lets it take its course, and then he's going to make something good out of it. But that same Christian will probably pray for sunshine on their wedding day. God must have something to do with that. Or perhaps even rain during a drought. I mean, even... The unbelievers will send up prayer uh, when the weather turns against them, like the unbelieving sailors who began praying to every god they could think of while Jonah was asleep down below deck. And then when Jonah told them that the storms which were threatening to sink their boat was the god who actually from his hand, he had sent the storm. In fact, Jonah chapter 1 and verse 4 says this, the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea. A picture in the Hebrew language is as if God is like a, a major league pitcher and he's, he's throwing this storm to the sea. 
When the sailors heard that Jonah's God was the God behind the storm, they started praying to him too. I read some time ago that after an earthquake, a group of pastors met at a prayer breakfast and they all talked about what had happened and they came to the conclusion that God had nothing to do with it. When their prayer breakfast was over, one of the pastors prayed the benediction and thanked God for the timing of the earthquake, which had taken place early in the morning before school buses and commuters were on the highway. When he finished his prayer, he said amen, and all the other pastors said amen with him. Well, how do you thank God for timing the earthquake if God is not in control of it? How do you explain the Lord himself being roused from sleep, a description of his humanity? He's in the middle of a hurricane out in the middle of the Sea of Galilee with his disciples, and he says to that storm and to those waves crashing, the text tells us, into the boat, Mark 4, peace be still. You can literally translate that, hush. Hush, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm, and the disciples said to one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? We're just as surprised in the biblical revelation of God's mastery and design and purpose, which might include suffering and sorrow and pain and death through secondary means like natural disasters has behind it all the primary means of God's purposes at work. Most oftentimes, he doesn't explain himself. Nahum, the prophet, introduced God to the people as the God who is in the hurricane, the God who is in the storm, Nahum 3.1. Isaiah records God himself speaking. God says this of himself, I form the light and I create darkness. I bring prosperity and I create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things, Isaiah 45.7. So, so keep this in mind. Well-meaning Christians will try to get off get God off the hook from having anything to do with it and God's standing there taking responsibility. Which is the only explanation, beloved, that gives any kind of hope. It wasn't random. It wasn't out of control. It wasn't meaningless. It wasn't without purpose. God didn't disappear. God didn't mess things up. God didn't turn his back and let nature run wild. God alone knows what his purpose is and one day perhaps will reveal it. Here's the confidence then of the believer. This is God's universe. This is God's storm. This is God's thunder. This is God's lightning. This is God's flood. This is God's rain. This is God's sunshine. This is God's quiet breeze and beautiful creatures. Is God in control of natural disasters? Noah would hope so as he's floating on a global flood. Is God in control of hungry predators? Well, that's the explanation Daniel gives the king the morning after he spends the night in the lion's den. Is God in control of that huge whale that swallowed Jonah alive, or is that a random event? Well, if Jonah didn't believe that God was in control, he would have never had a prayer meeting in the belly of that whale recorded for us in his journal where he says, Lord, you cast me into the deep. Your waves and your billows overwhelmed me. See, that gives him hope. Hopelessness is when where's God? He's gone. I guess we're on our own. If God can command the natural world, he can control it. It's in that kind of biblical framework of the character and sovereignty of God 
where we find confidence and rest, even when it looks like chaos, God is ultimately controlling the chaos, even when nature runs wild. We then, as one Puritan wrote, can learn to kiss the wave that has cast us upon the rock of ages. When we are, as Spurgeon said, shipwrecked on the island of God's sovereignty. What exactly can we learn from the physical storms of life? Let me suggest four lessons. First of all, natural disasters have a way of revealing to us the frailty of life. They reveal how utterly dependent we are on the basic things of life. About the time we get confident, the power goes out. And the water turns off. And, and we're back to wondering who has a fireplace and a pump. We're all going to come over to your house after church. To this day, there's talk of seeding clouds. But to this day, we can't make it rain. Just that one thing. Like several hundred years, uh, several Years ago, hundreds of people held hands downtown Atlanta, just outside the state capitol. Water levels were at an all-time low. State, that state and states around it were hit with a severe drought that had lasted a long time. Farmers were now relying on, on irrigation. Water restrictions put in place weren't compensating for the dwindling supply. And the governor of that state risked mockery and disdain and he got a truckload of it by the way when he called for a public prayer meeting outside the state capitol building and said and I quote I'm here today to appeal to you and to all people who believe in the power of prayer to ask God to shower us with the blessing of water a few years later the governor of Texas who was a presidential candidate made an even bolder statement by calling for an all-day prayer event in Houston where he invited all his fellow governor friends to join him and the public at large to, and I quote him, call upon Jesus to guide us through unprecedented struggles facing the country, including a multitude of natural disasters. There's nothing wrong with that. We're starting to get it right. Like I've seen atheistic leaders suddenly talk about praying when nature runs wild. Nothing wrong with that. Because every raindrop, every icicle, every tornado, every hurricane is part of his plan. And we ask for wisdom as he guides us through that. And in the face of that, we rediscover humility. That we are very small creatures. Humility. And we discover, rediscover the frailty of, of life and the powerlessness of any of us to either produce one drop of rain or in this case, turn the rain off. Nature, nature essentially becomes a tutor and it asks us, who do we think we are? are. It has a way of humbling us, which is a good thing. We bow before the creator and we acknowledge that something, something bigger is at work and someone greater than us is our refuge. There's a second lesson we can learn. Natural disasters have a way of reminding us to remain alert and walk closely with the Lord, believing, by the way, that God is in control doesn't eliminate responsibility to obey him. It doesn't remove the responsibility to walk with him, to stay alert to spiritual dangers that can come out of nowhere. Peter the apostle we studied together warned the believer to be on the alert for your adversary. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking somebody for lunch, right? 
You never know when a spiritual battle will begin, so we stay on high alert. And now that, if I can just take you here for a moment, this is where a, a hurricane is different from any spiritual battle you'll face, but the lesson remains the same. With a hurricane, you might have had several days of warning, and we did. We had plenty of advance warning. People were given ample ample opportunity to evacuate the danger zone. Meteorologists became everybody's favorite people. This past week, as the storm moved closer to landfall, with all the reporting and all the assessments and all the technology behind the storm, tracking and the wind gauging, and because we had all that information, not one of us ever had one thought I think I'll go spend the weekend in Wilmington, did we? No. We knew to avoid anything related to that direction, and they were getting out as fast as they could. We knew we, we, knew we needed to avoid that. Well, in the Christian life, <laughs> there are no meteorologists. Now, that might sound wrong. I don't mean they're not saved. Uh, <laughs> you understand what I mean? I'm sure some of them are. What I, what I mean is that there's no spiritual Doppler radar. You know, there, there are no images tracing that roaring lion. There, there are no spiritual weather updates, uh, you know, with these color images that, that give us updates every three minutes or, or so. There are no airplanes dropping into those swirling clouds uh, different instruments that measure the wind speed and, 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 the, and the breadth, the scope and size of these hurricane winds. There, there's no heavenly emergency warning system that interrupts your television program and says you're about to enter into a spiritual battle, be on the alert. There's no angelic message blaring from the sky saying tomorrow if you go that direction you're going to get into trouble. So what do you do? It's a reminder to walk with God today and you're right where you need to be tomorrow. Right after Peter warns us of that lion, trials and suffering, he encourages us that the Lord will give us the strength and grace to handle the suffering which will last a little while. 1 Peter 5:10. In the meantime, natural disasters have a way, thirdly, of reshaping our value system to focus on better things. Not comfort, but character. Not earth's pleasures, but the pleasure of God. Not wealth, but wisdom. Not health, but holiness. Our, our hands are so loaded down, holding on to things. Our hands are so full, so to speak, I'm afraid that when the rapture occurs, many Christians are going to go up feet first. <laughs> Suffering and trouble tend to empty our hands, don't they? They tutor us back to remembering what matters. Back to wise living. The psalmist wrote that lesson out when he put it this way. It is good for me that I was afflicted. Oh, really? Why? That I might learn your statutes. Psalm 119, verse 71. And I want you to catch the implication of his words here. The believer will experience affliction, call it sickness or trial or natural disaster or whatever, not because they sinned, but to keep them from sinning even more. Follow this. This is the testimony of the Apostle Paul who wrote, because of the amazing revelations given to me for this reason, to keep me from exalting myself, I was given a thorn in the flesh. I was given affliction. I was given suffering. 
to keep me from exalting myself, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 and 8. In, in other words, suffering kept Paul spiritually alert, spiritually minded. And at these times of natural disasters, we're all reminded, we're all put on alert to keep focused on what matters most. Let me give you a fourth lesson. Nature gone wild has a way of reminding the world of coming judgment, coming disaster, and final judgment. Every storm you see, well, as difficult as so many of our friends are experiencing it, they are nothing compared to the storms of the coming wrath of God. Following the rapture of the church, the Lord himself will unleash nature in such horrific ways that it's unimaginable. Whatever disaster you might imagine, the book of Revelation beginning at chapter 6 describes the final days of human history as we know it now. And the world will be inundated and impacted by drought, flood, hailstorms, wildfires which will burn up by the way a third of all the trees on the planet loss of drinking water famine disease rampant epidemics predatory animal attacks plagues mega earthquakes meteor and asteroid strikes on the earth's surface massive worldwide panic and on and on and on so no matter what you observe now it's just a whisper of the coming thunder of his wrath it's a it's a mere shadow compared to the lightning of his holy judgment which will come upon earth where he will take nature and literally use it as a scourge and a whip upon this planet and upon every unbeliever. The evolutionist, by the way, is scrambling to give mankind an escape clause. Like Voltaire, the French atheist who once wrote, we are insects living for a few seconds on atoms of mud. Mankind will only wish that were true. But instead, the Bible tells us that we are immortal souls, and you and I will live forever, either experiencing forever through unbelief, the justice of the Lord, or by belief in Christ, the joy of the Lord. So facing the full effects of the curse forever, or trusting in the Savior who faced the curse and defeated its consequences. Genesis 3 reveals to Adam, God speaking to him, some of what his sin will involve. He will sweat. That's the first time that word appears in the Bible, and we've been sweating ever since. He will sweat in the toil of his labor. Adam will try to tame the earth, to produce food and he's going to fight against the earth which is now going to resist and one of the ways it will resist is the proliferation of thistles and thorns Genesis 3 tells us and finally Adam will experience death but Jesus the second Adam the Bible calls him entered into this cursed and chaotic world and in the garden of Gethsemane he sweat. In his work of redemption he sweat. Great drops of blood. The labor of redeeming us from the curse. And then he's crucified and he's wearing on his brow a crown of thorns. And then he dies. Nature, nature gone wild is a warning of final judgment, but it's an invitation to believe in Jesus Christ who experienced the effects of a world cursed by sin. And he swept and he was pierced with thorns and he died. We sang it earlier in a hymn. 
The lyrics went, a second Adam walked the earth whose blameless life would break the curse, whose death would set us free to live with him eternally. Hallelujah. The chaos and turbulence of a cursed universe was entered by Jesus so that he could die for us and then rise from the dead to promise us life in him forever. So, beloved, in the meantime, nature around us not only reflects God's glorious attributes, and we've been looking at some of them, but also it reflects his attributes of wrath and justice. John describes first the throne of God, and whenever I'm in a thunderstorm and I can hear it crashing, I think of John's description of the throne of God, which has around it a continual peeling of thunder. And I'm so grateful for my Redeemer that it will never crush me. Whenever you hear every thunderclap, let it remind you of the awesome power of God. Let every lightning bolt cause us to reverence his holy purity. Let every rainstorm, let every flood remind us that the justice of God is rolling ever onward and one day will overflow its banks. And are you safe forever in Christ? Let every hurricane remind us of our weakness to save ourselves from the breath of God and to find safety in the only one who can give us refuge. Let every trial, let every heartache remind us of our confidence in the coming glory of Christ when he will take this cursed earth and remake it new. And in the meantime, we discover what matters most and to that rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee